So uh, I'll be presenting the NNLO QCD corrections to series, but I will be mostly presenting on the technical details. So lots of equations, less loss. Is it better now? Ah, okay. So you already listened to uh, Ravindran on Monday on this uh, topic, and this talk will be in continuation to that. So mostly the technical details. First few slides, I will just give a brief uh, summary why the motivations and all the basic things, and then I'll go into the detail. Uh, so main point is that EIC will uh, take really good precision measurements, uh, taking on precise data and what to do with all these data. We of course have to compare it with theory and to compare something, both should be on the same level we are talking about. So both should be similarly precise. So that means a precise theoretical description is very much needed. And one of the main process is this uh, DIS or uh, CDS and then pattern model cut, uh, connects the partonic cross-section to the hydronic one, and then we compute the partonic cross-section using the framework of perturbative QCD in uh, order by honor and alpha S. So that is the topic of this talk. Uh, so I, uh, this is one of my favorite example to show the power of the perturbative correction. Uh, so this is from LHC and for the Higgs measurement. And if we just roughly take all the theoretical calculation and we take only the leading order, the first term in our perturbative calculation, you see you get a number for 13 TV, which lies here. And these are our data points. And if we only consider this leading order, we are far away. We could never conclude that whatever we see is the standard model Higgs. Only if we include all NLO and Q, uh, NNLO and NQLO, then our graph looks like this. So that means 13 TV is somewhere here. That's a perfect agreement. And we can see, okay, we see the standard model Higgs. So that clearly shows, this is in context of LAC, of course, but that clearly shows that perturbative corrections are not negligible. They are really play a crucial role in discovery in, in many things. So we expect that for EIC also, the higher order corrections will play a very important role. So let me uh, introduce the process briefly, which again have been introduced on Monday. So that is DIS, but uh, we call it DIS when you fully integrate the final state. But if we tag the final state hadron, uh, it hadronizes, so that's a semi-inclusive DIS. And the only difference for me is the label or uh, the phase space that we have one additional constant delta. Uh, okay, so the hadronic part uh, is characterized by true structure functions, F1 and F2, and then uh, we can basically compute F1 and F2 connecting to the partonic Fs here through the PDFs and uh, to the fragmenting functions and uh, this F can be computed perturbatively. And that can be expanded in our strong coupling constant alpha S like this. And the alpha square, that's the second order correction, that is our interest for the moment. Okay, so again, I'm repeating the goal of this talk. So the motivations, kinematics, and basics have been discussed. And in this talk, we mainly discuss about how we compute all these things. So for that, uh, I need to introduce what are the things that we need to know at perturbative level. So uh, at uh, second order, basically you need some uh, two loop corrections. So that is easy to understand. We have the process at, this is at the partonic level, and then there can be two gluons in the loop. So that's called pure virtual corrections. Also there can be one gluon in the loop and one real emission. Now this is a kind of different process where there is an extra gluon. But if you integrate over the phase space of the gluon, then th that's the full integration over the phase space, and that also contributes at alpha square. So that also have to be computed. So the computation of the loop and the full phase space integration. Similarly, you can emit two gluons, which is a different process. But again, if you integrate these two gluons, uh, that contribute to the uh, single production of this quark, and also this double real needs to be taken care of. 
So all these diagrams, different processes needs to be computed, connect, uh, collected together, and um, finally we'll find the pattern cross section. But each individual contribution is divergent. Of course, there are different kinds of divergence, soft collinear UV, which needs to be taken care of. So one performs the renormalization, UV renormalization to counter the UV divergences. We sum up all the processes, degenerate processes through KLN theorem. They cancel all soft and uh, collinear terms. Whatever remains is the initial state collinear terms, which are uh, removed by mass factorization. Okay, now the question is, uh, there are few things to solve, like these loop integrals and the faceless integrals. So before going into that, let me summarize the total computational procedure. So this is the generic procedure for any loop uh, QCD calculation. So first, you draw the diagrams using some package, you graph, so you generate the Feynman diagrams. The Feynman diagrams means all the Feynman rules, which include uh, all terms in low range and Dirac and color algebra terms. You perform all these algebras in form routines. So once you are done that, uh, and you square the uh, amplitudes, you are left with only scalar quantities. So these scalar quantities uh, will look like this. So some propagators and some scalar products. But if we have uh, some phase space integrals, of course we have some delta over the final state particles. So we'll come to that uh, in detail later. And then whatever is there, like uh, some scalar products over um, propagators, so the, the scalar products can be written like that. This is a simple one loop example. So you can write to L dot P as some combination of this by looking at the propagators. And finally, you see some scalar integrals with a uh, constant in the numerator. Uh, why that is useful, we'll see that later. That if you have this kind of integrals, there, are, there will be like thousands of them, but you can find uh, some identity relations among them, and this will reduce them to a few numbers, all these integrals. So instead of doing thousands of integrals, you will be doing only tens of them, or maybe hundreds of them. So they are called master integrals, some name. And then you have to, of course, compute these remaining 10 integrals. You use some method, uh, which we'll, we are going to discuss. And uh, there are two methods. Uh, one is some generic method, which is known for 100 years, solving differential equation, which I'm going to discuss today. And then there is one method, which is canonical method by Hen, which has been discussed by Rabindran on Monday. And then you perform the renormalization mass factorization and evaluate it. So that's the uh, flow, workflow. Uh, let us first uh, see what is this integration by parts identities. Mm. There, very simply to say that uh, we work in D dimension for dimensional regularization. And in D dimension, we consider all the integrals to be very well behaved. That is our main criteria going to dimensional regularization. So if they are very well behaved, that means at infinity, they should be zero. So if you write down an integral of this form, that should be zero. So that's an identity. So let's take one very simple example. That's the one loop integral. But these are sets of integrals. So if n equal to one, this is one integral. For n equal to two, this is another integral. And these are an infinite sets of integrals. If you apply this uh, thing, apply this theorem, which is some kind of Gauss theorem, then you find one identity which tells you that i n plus one equals to uh, equals to i n in these terms. So that means you can think of a line where each dot is one i n, and all of them are related to the last one. So i two is related to i one, i three is related to i two, and then i one, and so on. So the point is, if you know the red dot, that is the i one, you know all of them. So that's the simplest picture of IBP reduction. So we can reduce hundreds or thousands of integrals to one integral. You solve one, everything is solved through this relation. Uh, let's take another example that's a bit more complicated with uh, one loop, but now we have two propagators. And we see if you just plot it uh, in a 3D that there are three integrals and you can think of any integral here, so N1, N2, and any integral can uh, come to these three points. 
So once you know these three points, you know all the integrals here, which is um, displayed by this n1, n2. So the relations you can think of like translations from one point to another, but the only thing you need to know is how to go from here to here. So you need to know the path and that should be efficient so that we don't use a lot of computers. Okay, so for our case, of course, that's not the simple. We work in two loop and many legs, three legs. So we have seven propagators, but still it's not difficult. For an NLO, it's doable. There will be thousands of Feynman integrals to start with, but it can be written in terms of like 20 or 20 for certain cases, so in total 60, 70 integrals. But of course, for three loop onward, it becomes extremely challenging, uh, just to make a comment. So another way to think of like this, that scalar integrals, they form a vector space, and IVP reduction is a projection to a basis vector. So this is a geometrical picture you can think of. And there are some programs available, Lightrate, Fire, and Kira, and so on. So different programs use different algorithms to solve them, but uh, for our case, this was not a challenge. Okay, finally, we found our set of integrals, which are like 60 around them, and we need to compute them. So how to compute them? Uh, let's have a look at the integral format. So it's like a two loop integral with some propagators. I can forget about what's inside, but I should know at the moment that this is a function of the space time dimension. This is a function of the kinematic invariance, say x and z. So what I can do, I can take a differential equation of this whole thing with respect to one of this uh, in kinematic invariance. For example, say x, so if I differentiate it with respect to z, the z comes in and differentiate the integrand, and that will give some combination of some other integral because you are simply differentiate it with respect to q. But uh, we have the tool, the reduction. We can reduce all that integral to our original case. So I can do this uh, differentiation on our chosen basis, chosen set, and I can come back to that set. So this will give us a form like this. So again, to think, uh, to have a geometrical picture, you can think that j's are our basis vectors. This operation, this ddj, is a kind of a rotation. You rotate it, and then IVP reduction is a projection to this basis vector, so you, you project it back. So basically, if you do for all of them, you get a matrix like this, where these are functions of rational functions of d, x, and z. Okay. Luckily for us, I mean, if we do this, that, that's very complicated. That's very difficult to solve while n is 50 or 60. Uh, for us, this uh, uh, comes in this form. There are reasons, of course, which I'm not going to uh, discuss, but this comes in this form. And writing this form has its advantage. Like, you see that this last one doesn't depend on uh, any other integral, it just depend on itself. It's a homogeneous differential equation. You can uh, immediately solve it. The second last, that depends on itself and the already solved ones. So you already know Jn, so that means you know the non-homogeneous part, and then you can readily solve it again. And so one by one, you can go up, you can solve one by one. Okay. So, we organize in such a way, and then we, of course, can have uh, systems like these where they are coupled, and we'll talk about this uh, in a moment. So, just before going to solve them, what we also do that we have also d in our uh, constants, and if we have d, that's more difficult. So, what we can do, we can do a Taylor expansion in epsilon, that is d equals to four minus two epsilon, a simple Taylor expansion, assuming or not assuming, knowing that this integral has some certain divergences in epsilon, which we know by physical exercises. And uh, that I can do, so I can just expand from epsilon minus two for this case, I have just taken one example, from minus two to any order. The c's are completely fine, and I can expand from zero to infinity, r can be minus two to this, and this simple expansion I do, it's a simple exercise, and then I get this formula. 
Now, this formula has uh, something to show is that if I look at some kth order, suppose I'm studying the kth order, that depends on only this part. The, the rest of the part is uh, lower order. So that's the homogeneous part. And it doesn't depend on the k. So that means each order, the homogeneous part is same. And that's something uh, good because uh, I can write down a simple algorithm to solve this order by order in epsilon. So for example, I have a complicated case where this is coupled. You can easily decouple it. So first take the uh, first row, solve for J2. If you solve for J2, you will get uh, some coefficient with J1 prime, some coefficient J1 plus some constant. So that's the solution for J2 from the first row. Put it back in the second row, and then you get a second order differential equation. So that second order differential equation we can easily solve because it depends on only one variable. We can solve for J1, and then uh, we can solve for epsilon minus two. That's the leading pole. Once we are done for that, we can use the second equation that's readily available and solve for J2 minus two, the epsilon square, one over epsilon square for J2. Once that is done, we can go back to this equation. Uh, we can start doing the same thing for minus one, putting all the results here. So you, you see that's a uh, cyclic process and we can put it in a computer program and then we can readily solve one by one. So now we are solving that part, but uh, what we are getting when we are solving this, we are getting some forms. So when we solve things, uh, we know that the various some constant method where there, there are Ronskians, Ronskians means the polynomials in, in the variables. So this is an integrate, integration over some polynomials and some functions. These are iterated integrals. And that's easy to understand why. Because first we solve for one of epsilon square, we get something, we take it to the one over epsilon and we integrate it again. So there is a repeated integration over and over, and that gives us the terms which are called iterated integrals. The simplest example of iterated integrals is polylogs. Like polylogs is log x over one minus x, and so on, polylog two, polylog three, and polylog four, they are integration over uh, polylog n minus one and one over one minus x. So these results we can get in terms of some generalized polylogs. Okay, uh, then of course you may ask, uh, like we were in Feynman integrals, now our result in terms of some integrated integrals, what are we gaining? These are again some integrals which needs to be evaluated. Well, the point is for Feynman integrals, the numerical evaluation, which we finally need, we finally need a number, and the numerical integration is really tedious. People tried this, succeeded for some cases, but not very precise. I mean, you can hardly attend like four, five digit precision with uh, good machines. And on the other hand, iterated integrals are one dimensional. There are some properties and these properties allows you to evaluate them very, very precisely and in a short amount of time. That's what we exactly need. So uh, there are two properties, sample and scaling invariance, and this allows all these things. Till date, we were happy because all the integrals we solved, like they came in terms of simple GPLs, which look like some integral over some simple polynomial in the denominator, and then some integration. So that's the iterated part. But the integrand was mostly like this. They are simple. Recently what happened that uh, for complicated cases, we, uh, we faced some square roots. So square roots means there is a square root here. Now, the pro uh, what is the problem with the square root? You cannot easily do the numerical integration for, uh, because you need to perform analytic continuation properly. So what do we do with that? So there can be two conditions. One is the square roots, we can rationalize it. So that means we can find a suitable transformation. Let's take some example. For example, we have the square root in X. Uh, you can use simple Landau transformation, S equals to this, and that gives you some one plus X over X. Again, it becomes very simple polynomial in X. So of course, uh, now you are not in S space, but going to X space, but we have a nice mathematical result. So that's possible, but what can happen, it can be non-rationalizable. So that means there uh, exists no single transformation uh, which can rationalize all square roots simultaneously. But of course, that's a mathematical statement and 
we are physicists, so we can tweak things. Uh, so we find the two magic words that there do not exist the single transformation and you cannot do it simultaneously. But what we can do, we have multiple transformation and we don't want to do it simultaneously. So that's the trick we can use. And then you can divide the whole system in two subsystems and uh, deal them separately and combine them. Of course, by doing so, we have our result in a nice form, but uh, what we lose is that there are different arguments. So instead of X, we have now X and Y, and X and Y both are related. So it's something complicated to study or understand, but our results are very nice. And if we keep these things in mind that X and Y are related, we can evaluate them numerically very precisely. Okay, so uh, then uh, phase space computation procedure. So that's all these things, IBP reduction and uh, the method of differential equation. Those were mainly loop integration technique. Now we have some phase space integration to do. So the phase space integration, uh, they look like this. Right, you have one integration over suppose one gluon, uh, second gluon, and the produced uh, quark. There are some uh, scalar products in terms of L1 and PA, all these momenta, incoming and outgoing momenta, and some uh, on cell conditions for the gluons. So, this integral we normally do uh, using the angular integration. I mean, that's our textbook uh, things. We all know that uh, these integrations, when we have many deltas, uh, uh, this um, integration over the angular parameters, they become very, very difficult, extremely challenging. And for our cases, of course, uh, some of them are give us complicated problems. So the idea is that if somehow we can write this integral in, in the loop integral format and apply our methods, which we just discussed, the method of IBP and D, so the point is that the IBP and D, they do not really depend on the physics part. They only need the format or the form of this. So if we only do that, it's good enough to apply them. So there is this reverse unitarity. You can write delta in this form, and they look like Feynman propagators. Of course, there is a difference. There is this I0 sitting there, and there is all this combination. But again, this part doesn't change anything in the differential equation. So once we get the differential equation, that's true for this, so that is true for delta, and we can have the same differential equation, and we solve it. The only input, the physics input, what we need in a solving differential equation is the boundary condition, right? So the boundary condition that we evaluate uh, considering the actual phase space integration. That's easy to do because in a boundary, you put some limits, and putting some limits makes this integration easy. So once you take the limits, you compute the boundary, and through that, all the information, the physics information goes in for the phase space integrals. Okay, so by doing so, we basically compute all the phase space integrals. So finally, I come back to the picture. So here, that's the loop integration. We used the method of IBP and differential equation. We computed them, but they were available for long. I mean, these are simple two-loop integrals. Then this is the uh, real virtual integral, where that is the uh, one-loop box and one real emission. So that means there will be one uh, delta, extra delta compared to this. So we can write down using reverse unitarity. So for this case, there will be one loop integration, one phase space integration using reverse unitarity and we write down the differential equation again, solve it, and we get the uh, total amplitude. Similarly for double real, so there will be two phase space integration, so that means two delta functions, and uh, using the same technique, we can uh, compute the integrals, we can compute the amplitude. Once all of them are computed, see uh, these gluons can be soft and collinear, same for here and here. Now, the Kellen theorem uh, tells us that uh, you add all um, degenerate contributions, like this gluon can be uh, soft and this can be soft. Also, same for that. That's the degenerate case. We cannot distinguish between them. So 
So once you combine them, that cancels all the soft and collinear part. And uh, only remaining pieces are the uh, initial state collinear singularities for which we need to perform the mass factorization for both for, uh, for the initial quark and for the final fragmenting quark. And after performing that, we obtain the finite partonic cross-section. So I will come to my results. So once uh, we have done that, we, for the moment, we have computed the non-singlet contributions to the Q to Q process. So quark initiated process and then final state quark is fragmenting. And uh, for that, uh, this is the result when we have integrated uh, the X and only plot it with respect to the uh, scaling variable of the final state uh, fragmenting quark, the Z. And we see that the K factor is quite large for NNLO for this contribution, which is around uh, 1.3 to 1.4 at that region. Of course, uh, the scale behavior, the renormalization scale, that's uh, not great at this point, and that's easily understandable because for this, we are using a template, uh, we are using a model, which is close to a realistic model to, for the PDFs and FFs, but they do not include all the dependence on mu f. Once they are properly included there, this uh, would improve for NNLO. Okay, of course, we need checks. So the master integrals, they are computed in using different methods. One method was described by Ravindran, and today I described another method, and uh, then also we computed some of them using normal technique, just doing the angular integration, and all of them agree, which is a quite nice check. Then mass factorization removes all remaining infrared singularities, because mass factorization, that's universal quantity, unless your uh, calculation is correct, it cannot completely cancel the poles, so that is also works, uh, that also works as a check. And then some partial results uh, were available uh, in the threshold limit. And uh, in basically uh, X prime going to one, Z prime going to one limit. And we have checked uh, successfully with those results. And then of course the constraint that uh, the, which kills the inclusiveness of the quark, that can be integrated in our analytic result. And then of course we should find the total result which connects to the inclusive DIS. And then we found perfect agreement with the fully inclusive result. Okay, uh, with that, I will uh, come to my concluding remarks uh, that EIC will unravel the mysteries of strong force and we need theoretical precision uh, studies to understand uh, or to, to fully exploit the EIC data. And our current understanding is standard model and we need higher order quantitative corrections for that because that will control, that will give us the actual or close to actual value and also controls the uncertainties arising from the renormalization uh, factorization scales. And uh, in this talk, I have presented the computational details uh, to obtain this uh, NNLO QCD corrections to see this. And we are still uh, working on that to get uh, more results. And the technicalities, they are more generic. So that means they can be used for any other processes also. And aside uh, from the phenomenological impact, uh, the use of these technologies to these kind of things with two kinematic variables and with phase space integrals, that sets a milestone in computational technology. So with that, I thank you. For a, a very Clear talk. Uh, do we have questions, Raju? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was a really nice talk. Um, Thank you. So, um, one of the questions with these iterated integrals is that I mean, do you? I mean, it, is it still n factorial growth that you that you have, or are you? I mean, because when you compute Feynman integrals, is n factorial growth with each loop order? Uh, right. so, so at each level of perturbative QCD, um, it depends on the it depends on the process. So uh, suppose I talk about a very simple case, and these iterated integrals. What I wrote down here. Um, so this a can be one minus one and zero for simple cases, 
and that defines your iterativeness. Now, if you are a true loop, you have at most, at finite cases, uh, four iterative iteration. And four iteration means you can write down a basis which is a certain number. I mean, with one minus one zero, you can write down something. You go to three loop, you have six iteration. So it's not an n factorial game. Okay, but it depends on other topologies. Like if it is in bit complicated cases, there are new A's appearing. Right. So it can be much more complicated there. And for example, for three loop, if we go, uh, the number of uh, this A becomes really large, and that point it's much more than whatever we had to look. Right. Because I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, if you just do Feynman diagrams, right, there's clearly in factorial growth. Yeah. And it's not clear. I mean, so these are just looking within the, um, I mean, it's a, yeah, I don't see anything that's formally canceling the one or n factorial, right? In, in, in what you no, yeah. this can yeah. be much more growth. Uh, and right. that's happening because right. uh, here I'm being a bit formal, but uh, the substructure we are right. imagining within Feynman diagrams right. or Feynman integral are not these. They may right. be something which are collection of these. Right. So people are studying this. And so some collection of iterative integral, uh, these H's or G's, they can form a substructure, and that can be related with the Feynman integrals, right. but so, not this. So a very specific question is that, you know, say the state of the art in G minus two is partial five loop. Yes. And so the, the question is, you know, and that was done traditionally without using these, these techniques. And so have these, can these speed up you know, computations of say G minus two? Really, the answer whether they will yeah. speed up. It's outside the scope of what you're uh, talking about. Yeah. yeah. So there are two things. I also work on something uh, like you take the differential equation and I want to solve it. Instead of going to this form, I can directly solve it, getting a number. I can do some simple series expansion solution, and they are much more efficient in some cases. So why taking this? Uh, they have certain advantage. Like you can write it down and keep it, so the results are there while I'm solving it numerically by some series expansion something, uh, some user after five years, they may have to redo it if they're not properly written because they're all numbers. Instead, these are analytical forms. And if we want to study some analytical properties, they are useful. By looking at some numbers, I cannot see that. So there are some pros and cons for both. Uh, Sandro? Yeah, the, the last technical and more general question. How, what do you plan to do next? I mean, what are the other possible, I'm here, yes. Other possible applications of these uh, advanced uh, calculations, what do you plan to calculate? Well, uh, at the moment we only computed Q to Q. We have to compute at all of them. And uh, also, so there are a few studies out of this. So you have to include mass. And then also what we can do, we can study the correlation of these things to Trillion. And there are certain correlations at NLO, but in NLO, no. So there are lots of studies on that. Only for this one. And then the technology can be used anywhere. And that we are, of course, doing. We are working on Trillion. That's for LHC, but uh, any other Trillion and in the, uh, mass, of, mass of W bosons. For, do you plan to do something polarized? Yes. Um, yeah, very, very nice results. Um, do, do I understand correctly that the calculation is at leading color? Yes. Um, could, could you comment, you know, just, I don't know, from, from your techniques, does subleading color cause I don't know, is that a lot more difficult, you know, with the techniques that you developed, or is that? Well, uh, the only difficulty here is this part. So for leading color, everything was rationalizable and nice. So we got the result. For uh, the sub, uh, subleading part, so that's a small part. So most of the subleading part is already there. For a small part, we have some non-rationalizable term, and we computed them using the square roots. The result is there, but we want to present them a bit nicely and so that the numerical evaluation becomes very trivial. And for that, we are working on that. 
but uh, in principle, the result is there for subleting Okay, okay. there's not a major complication. There is no major complication. Okay, okay. Yeah. thanks. Anything else? Okay, I don't see anything else. I will ask a very, very nice question. So your, your CDs that you're computing in your factorization, this is in the collinear level. So essentially you have a collinear object, PDF and the collinear fragmentation function. Yes. Suppose I want to do it instead of the collinear limit, the full TMD limit. Is it possible to do any of this or, or how complicated it will be? I, I have to think about it, but uh, to compute TMDs, I don't think it would be possible to do that. I want yeah. to inside a TMD instead of a PDF, instead yes. of taking yes. a collinear. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So all these techniques don't go through. Well, the technologies are technologies. They don't depend on the physics. But how to apply them, that I have to check, because uh, I did not. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.